Welcome to uh, the uh, area briefing for Drive Sober for uh, agencies in uh, this area. My name is Bob Criswell. I'm a law enforcement liaison with the Highway Safety Office. Uh, kind of give you a little idea of what we're going to do today in order to get our message out about uh, the campaign. We have some uh, members of the media here to partner with us to help us get that message out. And we're going to do a little short press thing at first. Then we're going to roll into the area briefing and talk about the nuts and bolts of the enforcement campaign. And then, of course, we'll uh, have a chance to network and have some lunch after that's over with. So that being said, I'd like to introduce uh, uh, H.B. Elkins, and he's going to take it for over from here. My name is H.B. Elkins. I'm the Public Information Officer for the Department of Highways District 10 out of Jackson. And I will admit that I'm on foreign turf today. Now, if we were doing this one county to the west, McGoffin County, uh, we'd be on my home turf. But uh, Johnson County is part of Highway District 12 uh, out of Pikeville. Sarah George, that most of you are used to seeing at these events, uh, is the PIO for District 12. But she's on vacation. So they tell me day before yesterday that I'm going to be filling in for her today. And I'm a poor imitation of Sarah because, number one, I've got this fuzz on my face, and number two, I don't have the dangly earrings that she always wears that every time I go home and my wife will ask, well, what kind of earrings did Sarah have on today? So I'm going to, I'm no Sarah George, but I'm going to try to fill in for her. Uh, obviously, we're here to discuss this year's Drive Sober or Get Pulled Over. Uh, Law Enforcement Highway Safety Campaign. It is a national campaign that starts August 17th, that's next Wednesday, I believe, and runs through September 5th. It's the annual Labor Day Enforcement Campaign uh, where we concentrate on impaired driving, but we also uh, will watch for uh, seatbelt usage and all those other things that are so important to highway safety. In this part of Kentucky, we partner with our neighbors in Virginia, in West Virginia, to do border to border checkpoints. And we're glad to have some of our neighbors from West Virginia here today. And we'll be hearing from one of them here in just a few minutes. So we hold these briefings across the region and across the state to make the law enforcement officers aware of the particulars of this campaign, uh, to give them some information. Uh, to provide them with uh, some background on why we do this so when they go back into their communities and start the Drive Sober Enforcement Campaign that they'll know kind of what's going on. Uh, after our speakers are done today, uh, we've got a couple of them. Uh, the briefing will begin. Bob will be doing the briefing. Uh, those of you who are members of the press that are here are welcome to stay and figure out uh, kind of what this is all about, what we're doing. Some of you were here in the spring for the uh, clicker ticket briefing, so it'll be similar to that. And then you're welcome to, to stay for lunch afterwards. We do, do ask that if you plan to stay for lunch, that you sign the sign-in sheet that will be going around so we can account for all the meals. Uh, as of right now, we have 462 fatalities in the state of Kentucky. That's as of today, compared to 425 last year. So the number of fatalities is up. And speculation is that lower gas prices mean more people are out driving, which means more uh, chances for uh, fatal crashes on the highways. 81 of those fatalities are alcohol related. That's 17.5%, or if you want to round up, almost 20% of the total. So that's saying like one in five or one of six fatalities in Kentucky are uh, alcohol related or impaired drivers. 177 of those fatalities weren't wearing their seat belts. And that's 38% of the total. Round up again, close to 40. That's two out of five. Two out of every five people killed in a Kentucky crash this year was not wearing their seat belt. So you know, that's something to, to keep in mind. We had something uh, hit home with the transportation cabinet earlier this week in Hazard which is not too far away from here. A gentleman from the Transportation Cabinet Central Office in Frankfurt was going to our Perry County garage to work on a, a radio tower, a radio repeater. And a woman, I, sometimes I say lady, but I don't think this was a lady, uh, ran into him, crashed into him head on. She was injured, he was not. She was impaired and they found marijuana and methamphetamine in her car. So this could happen to anybody. If you're on the road, 
just going to do your job, you can have a bad encounter with an impaired driver. And I think all the law enforcement folks here in the room, everybody knows that. So that's why this is so important, to try to keep our people safe, people who are just trying to go to family activities, go to church, go shopping, go to work, do their jobs. We're trying to keep them safe, which is why we do these enforcement campaigns, especially drive sober and get pulled over. Mm -hmm. We want to be good neighbors, so we'd like to have uh, our folks from West Virginia uh, come up first. Uh, one of our speakers today is Harry Anderson. He is the state program administrator for West Virginia's Governor's Highway Safety Program. Mr. Anderson served on active duty with the U.S. Army, retiring after 21 years in 2003. After his retirement from the military, he accepted a position with the Driver Services Division of the West Virginia Division of Motor Vehicles. He served in this department for nine years, culminating as the manager of the DUI Interlock Program. During his tenure, the Interlock Program grew from less than 400 participants in January 2003 to over 3,200. He's a founding member of the Association of Ignition Interlock Program Administrators and has played key roles in the various DUI law study panels, joint agency DUI law meetings, and legislative subcommittee briefings in West Virginia, contributing to the passage of the DUI repeat offender and aggravated DUI laws in West Virginia. Since 2011, he has served as a state program administrator in the West Virginia Governor's Highway Safety Program and is the state impaired driving coordinator. He's the grant manager for West Virginia's Drug Recognition Expert Program and also serves as the co-chair of the Technical Advisory Committee, which oversees the selection officers for DRE training, Drug Recognition Expert Training. That's why we're always glad to partner with our neighbors uh, because this is a multi-state and a national effort. We're always glad to partner with our neighbors in West Virginia and Virginia here in the eastern part of the state to make sure that we work together to take these impaired drivers off the road. So please welcome Mr. Anderson. I think I didn't realize Ms. Marie all that when uh, she had asked me for a little bit of a bio here a couple weeks ago. Uh, I, I, pre I really do truly uh, appreciate the opportunity to be, be here. Thanks for the uh, uh, Kentucky Highway Safety Office, uh, Bob Criswell. Uh, my boss, Bob Tipton, couldn't be here. He had back surgery last week, or he would be up here, and he'd probably take, he'd take a couple little jabs at you. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to talk about a lot of data or a lot of one-liners and things like that. I just I, The first thing I want to do is just say thank you. Thank you for everything that you do and everything that you're going to do moving forward. As you get a little older and you start to look back on the things that you've done in life, I'm, I'm envious of, of you guys that are still able to go out there and make a difference in somebody's life because everybody that's in here can do that, especially when it goes to taking a... Uh, an impaired driver uh, off of our highways. Uh, just a little quick story. Here in the last year, we had a, uh, a bad crash on the West Virginia Turnpike where an impaired driver probably had got off the turnpike to relieve himself. When he gets back on the turnpike, he starts going south in the northbound lanes. Another vehicle coming south, family coming back from vacation, three adults, five children, in a Dodge Durango, do the math, no, there wasn't seat belts for, for everybody, so you take a bad situation, you make it worse, and end up killing six of them. Now, from the moment of impact to the time that somebody in another state, and I want to say that this family was from Ohio, uh, there was a lot of things that, that had to happen, and, and I, I, I feel for you. When I'm looking at it on a piece of paper, to me, it's it's more than just a piece of paper. You know, there, there's, there's a life, and there's a a meaning behind every one of those names that's on that piece of paper. And it, 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 it isn't lost with me and a lot of people that we are, we're now pencil pushers when we're looking at that, that, you know, some officer had to sit down and our group officers put together when you have, you know, you got dead children here along the highway trying to figure out who's the mom, who's the dad, who, you know, who am I going to notify? So. You're in that unique situation where you can't catch every one of them. We understand that. But every time that you take an impaired driver off the road and you make an arrest, you potentially stop things like that from happening. I know that you know that, but I want you to know that we know that. And this is not just a, 
you know, an administrative process for us. We know that and we respect that. You have the opportunity to, to, to change people's lives. There, there's no doubt in my mind that there's people, there's families out there right now, vacation, uh, something as simple as a picnic or, or they can get together this weekend and, and have a family dinner. And, and they're doing that because there's there's something that you had done. There was a there was a link in that chain that when somebody got to the forks of the road and made the wrong decision and took the wrong wrong fork in that road, they ran across you. You stopped them, and those families get the opportunity to to enjoy that. We understand that. We we appreciate what you do, especially especially in this day and time with the additional burdens. That, that's put on you when you have to go out there and do your job. I would have never thought just a year ago when we were talking about putting together checkpoints and coalitions like this and stuff that we would have to think about when you get a bunch of officers from different agencies in one spot, we would have to worry about their safety from some knucklehead in the general public. But that's, that's the nature of the environment that you're working in now. And you get up every morning and you still continue to do that. And I can, I can assure you from where we're at and most of the people in society, they, 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 they understand that. They, they respect what you do. You have the opportunity to, to change that. I, you know, I know every year we do these things and we, we go back. We, I, I keep feeling like I'm going back to the, to the well and asking you to do it. Just do it one more time. You know, continue to fight the good fight. When I was working the, the license reinstatement uh, process of, of DUI, I, I probably talked to no less than probably 20,000 offenders, and there was a common there was a common theme in the, the overwhelming majority of them. When you get to the point where you tell them what they're going to have to do, the processes that they have to do to get their driver's license back, you know, they're really ticked off, and and, and they'll say, "Well, I didn't kill nobody," and really. The truth of the matter is, they probably didn't kill nobody because you got to it before they had an opportunity to do that. You know, there's been several studies, and I think probably a good ballpark pit figure is somewhere around the average offender drives 200 times before you know they ever get cited the first time. I mean, you know, do the math. So it, it doesn't go unnoticed. We appreciate it. I, I really, uh, when we had a, a pair driving call. Uh, earlier this week and we talked about some of the things that we was doing uh, I was just happy to have this this kind of cord, uh, coordination here especially with the eastern part of the state because the eastern part of the state is what is, is what I'm going to be concerned with anyhow a few years ago I was, uh, I was telling Bob that we had went to Louisville and we had was talking to your system here in Kentucky is a little bit different well it's a lot different than the way we deal with it in West Virginia but we had a judge that stood up right up in as we was trying to build a reciprocal agreement with the state, said he didn't care about Ashley, he didn't care about Grayson. He says, I only worry about the soccer moms here that the law enforcement officers keep picking on and, and citing for DUI. I mean, that was his mentality of DUI. So I, I know you have a tough road. The environment is bad enough that you, you add something like that into it. I don't even know if he's a judge anymore, and I, I really can't remember his name. You can probably go back and look at the notes. So it's, it's tough. I appreciate what you're doing. Uh, I, I appreciate the opportunity to come here and just to see what you're doing on this side of the state. We're doing the same thing on the other side of the state. Uh, one of the things I'm probably most proud of in West Virginia, we was the last state in the nation to become a DRE state. We're very fortunate to have uh, a, a very dedicated police officer who's actually out in Colorado right now at the DUI conference, the uh, DRE conference, that's really taken our program and, and grabbed by the horns and has really developed it and really made me and Bob and a few other people look a lot better than we really are. And and if there's on this part of the state, you got Bo Evans, Joey Coer is the police officer I'm talking about in the police department myself. You can you can go through Bob if there's anything you ever want to do. Because the, the, when we say impaired driving, we're obviously we're not just talking about alcohol. We got some counties in our state that over 50% of the arrested impaired drivers, it has nothing to do with alcohol, it's, it's, it's some other kind of drug. Uh, Joey's a top guy. He's had over 1,000 DUI arrests in the last five years. I said I wouldn't want to go with numbers and data hitch. But he's that kind of guy. He can, I mean, he's tough. He expects a lot from you if you want to become a DRE. But he, I would like to develop, take this even one step further and walk and work with that part of it because there's a serious
serious drug problem in this part of the state and in our part of the state, all across the state, especially in the southern part of it. And there's there's a lot of meat on the bone, and that's that's really the next thing. And it's a whole the court system, the laws has made it so hard, at least for us, on that side of the, the, the border to to prosecute an impaired driver for something other than alcohol, because alcohol is so scientific, you've got that BAC reading. Basically, in, in our state, you're just boiling down to something, proper procedure, and, and uh, you had had some proper reason to pull them over. But drugs, that's that, that's something that's not going to go away. And anybody in a leadership position that's in here that wants to develop that, take that a step, a step farther, do some kind of coordination with us, hey, we're, we're here to do it. But again, look, I, I'm just just one more. That's what I'm asking. Just just one more. It, get in that friendly competition. See who can get get the most. And, and every time that you do that, you potentially take away a headline story on the front page of a newspaper or the first 15 seconds of a, of a, a, a you know a news your nightly news. I appreciate it. There's people out there that don't even understand what you do. And I know you don't do this for that reason, but you continue to get up every day, put your boots on, put your uniform on, and go out there and do what you do. We appreciate it. And thanks a lot. Be careful. Good luck. Thank you for coming to be with us today and sharing the message. It's interesting that uh, he talked about a, a judge in Louisville that thought that uh, police officers were picking on soccer moms for DUI. I think everybody probably here in this room has heard about the Pike County Highway Safety Team and the recognition that they've gotten uh, across the state and nationally. And I know one of the complaints there, and like I say, I'm not Sarah. Sarah is an integral part of that team, and she can tell you uh, more about it than three other people ever could. But one of the issues that they had in Pike County was just the random, or not random, but widespread dismissal of tickets that never got into the court system. And one of the efforts of the Pike County uh, Highway Safety Team is they kind of uh, made that procedure uh, politically incorrect, and, and from what I understand, they don't really do that anymore. But one of the driving forces of that uh, is our next speaker, uh, Rodney Scott, the sheriff of Pike County. He started his career in the Pike County Circuit Clerk's Office, and he spent 16 years as Pike County's jailer, and initiated several programs that improved the facility and rehabilitation option for the inmates there. Bible studies, uh, substance abuse rehab opportunities, worked closely with the district and circuit court drug courts when they were established, uh, pursued grants for uh, programs and equipment, and expanded the work release program. He's midway through his first term as Pike County Sheriff now, and was elected two years ago. He's actively participated in these targeted enforcement campaigns offered by NHTSA, National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, through the Kentucky Office of Highway Safety, which is what drives sober or get pulled over, click it or ticket are. And is committed to doing everything that he can within his, within his authority and his deputies to reduce the number of crashes on the roads in Pike County. He's brought the Pike County Sheriff's Office into unprecedented partnerships with Pikeville City Police, Kentucky State Police, and Kentucky Vehicle Enforcement. And his office actively participates in the Pike County Highway Safety Team. And as I said, they've gotten national acclaim for their efforts in reducing the number of fatalities in what once was considered one of the deadliest counties in Kentucky. It's Kentucky's biggest county it's Kentucky's most mountainous county, and it was also one of the deadliest counties in Kentucky for traffic deaths. And they've seen a great reduction in the number of deaths since the beginning of the highway safety team's uh, efforts. And we're glad to have Sheriff Scott with us today to talk to you a little bit. And then we'll throw it to Bob for, uh, for the schedule briefing. How come he didn't have to speak 30 minutes? You told him my speech has to be 30 minutes. Uh, no, I want to thank Bob and, and Matt uh, for all they've done since I've been sheriff of Pike County for the last year and a half. Uh, we appreciate everything. Uh, we try to utilize as much as possible. Um, 
You know, the drive's over, getting pulled over campaign starts August 19th, runs through September 5th. Uh, Labor Day weekend falls in there. Last long weekend, long, long weekend of summer. Uh, everybody's last little getaway before cold weather. Everybody's last little get together before cold weather. And, uh, you know, when everybody gets together, they most people want to party, have a good time, but, uh, you know, we, we can uh, deter, deter this a little bit uh, by just <clears throat> making our efforts out being seen. Uh, so we can, uh, numbers of impaired drivers on Kentucky roadways uh, by increasing the checkpoints or, uh, you know, just being out patrolling more. Anything we can do to, uh, you know, to reduce these numbers is, is what we try to do. Uh, you know, Pike County, we do have some few four lanes, but most of our roads are two lanes or, or one lane roads. So, you know, we, we get off on those up in the hollers and, you know, on the two lane roads to do, to do the checkpoints. But, uh, you know, we do appreciate everything that they've done for us. <clears throat> According to the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, Average of one alcohol impaired driver fatality occurs every 51 minutes. The National Highway Traffic Safety also uh, notes that high visibility of inf enforcement reduces alcohol impaired driver fatalities as much as 20%. This is why I encourage each of you to increase your patrol and safety checkpoints during this campaign. Another way we can also Law enforcement can help reduce the number of alcohol and driving fatalities is by educating our communities. I encourage you to utilize social media sites and local newspaper and television to get out the drive sober or get pulled over message. There are helpful hints and suggestions on the Kentucky Highway Safety page or create your own uh, public safety. Uh, the important message to get out here is that you know, the Labor Day holiday weekend is one of the deadliest times of the year in terms of drunk driving fatalities. We as law enforcement need to make an effort to let our citizens know if they drive sober or get poured over. Thank you. Thanks, Sheriff. We're going to do now start with the briefing, and then I'd like to see we have some members of the media. These speakers will be here, and other law enforcement folks, if uh, you guys have questions or anything. I think once you see the briefing, it may uh, give you a lot of background information, maybe it'll be you know, even a little bit better on um, what kind of questions you want to talk about. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, some of the important things to remember about this campaign. Most of you guys in here all participate and have uh, uh, overtime highway safety grants. Of course, what we're asking of you is to look at the dates. Uh, we're going to start it on August the 19th, running through the Labor Day weekend through uh, September 5th. And what we ask is of those of you that have enforcement grants to make sure that you conduct a maximum enforcement effort during that time period. Okay? And make sure that your guys that aren't necessarily working overtime but are just out on regular shifts, that they know that this campaign is going on so that they can focus their efforts because, uh, of course, we count what you do on regular time and what you do on overtime uh, with, with the enforcement effort. Uh, a very important thing to, to remember in here is that uh, the online reporting deadline is September 19th. So you want to make sure that you remember that. Make sure that you go to your online account and drop your enforcement numbers in there. Once again, that's the regular overtime numbers and the regular time numbers together drop them in, in and uh, report it to the office because once again the paperwork reporting part is a very important part of what we're trying to do. Okay, we're going to look at, uh, we always go back and review what we did for clicking or ticket and uh, we're going to look at that real quickly. Uh, of course what we see when you compare and contrast 2015 with 2016 is that uh, the biggest thing that jumps out to you obviously is the number of seatbelt citations has gone down. Uh, if you look at the other uh, categories of enforcement, they remain basically the same, with uh, the difference basically being the number of seatbelt citations that have, have gone down. Now, uh, 
we're going to talk about uh, uh, this campaign and even though uh, we want to make sure that everybody knows that there's that many numbers of uh, overtime enforcement hours, 445,000. Uh, we talk about nighttime enforcement, we talk about weekend enforcement, we're going to talk about through this briefing several times the importance of it because uh, what the data shows us is that's when those crashes are happening. Okay, so that's why we want to put the most boots on the ground when apparently the offense is occurring. Uh, you see that number over 100,000 enforcement hours worked during the two weeks of clicker ticket back in May, and that uh, 205 agencies out of about 400 in Kentucky actually reported for that campaign. <coughs> Got a little video I want to show you here really quick. The first part of it doesn't have any audio on it, but the end does. Uh, not meant to make fun of anybody or anything, but just kind of, I guess, kind of brings it into focus. Uh, some of the things that happen. <coughs> you may have seen this. It was widely reported in the national media uh, sometime back. It's from Illinois. my legs stuck in the grill okay it's not a butterfly you know it's uh, think about somebody that's that out of touch with reality driving vehicles down the road speaking okay you know it's kind of funny but i think it really shows a point we talk about this campaign focuses on impaired driving we say impaired driving because we mean alcohol drugs both because you know what a, a big problem drug driving is but in Kentucky, we need to make sure that we don't lose our focus on seatbelts, child passenger safety seats. We need to keep that being a priority and make sure that there's a zero tolerance for those too. And talk about, once again, like three or four times I'm going to say, nighttime, weekend, focus enforcement, checkpoints, so forth. This is a, uh, if you're not familiar with where Curry County is, it's in, uh, South Central Kentucky, it's uh, right across from Whitley, uh, Interstate 75 base, basically cuts those two in two. Uh, small Sheriff's Department, three or four deputies. Uh, Mike Neal was, I think it was on a Friday night, was out back in March, and uh, he met a car coming at him, crossed the center line, just kept crossing, just kept crossing. And of course he went all the way over to the guardrail to try to get away, but there's no way to get away from him. Hit him head on. Uh, Fortunately, the driver was impaired. Fortunately, uh, Neil had his seatbelt on, he was wearing his body armor, and he survived the crash. Of course, what our point is on that is to take back to your guys, your deputies, your officers, your troopers, is make sure. Tell them one more time. Make sure they wear their belt. Make sure they wear their body armor. Okay? Because we all know the best defense against an impaired driver for anybody is wearing your seatbelt. You gotta keep pounding that. Uh, I think that video was taken from the checkpoint we did down at the Cumberland Gap Tunnel with uh, Tennessee. Uh, I think it was last uh, spring we did it. Uh, I wanted to talk about when you look at Kentucky impaired crash data, about half of all those impaired fatalities occur between 21 and 03. Okay, that gives you some idea about uh, why we come up with the time we come up to focus our enforcement. And if you look at the, the second graphic there, it says about a third of the drivers in fatal crashes on the weekend are alcohol compared. 
and when you look at during the week, it's about 15%. So once again, that gives you a time frame, and it gives you two days of the week to concentrate your enforcement on to get the most bang for the buck. Uh, because obviously that's what we want to do is, uh, we talk a lot about uh, tickets, we talk about making arrests, we talk about checkpoints, we talk about all this stuff. But what we're trying to do is we're trying to reduce the number of injuries, and we're trying to reduce the number of fatalities. That's that's what this is all about. That's why we're here. That's why we're talking. Uh, as those of you know that have your grant funding, you know you're required to work a certain amount of your overtime at nighttime. And what the nighttime hours are for Kentucky is 15:03. They did a data search like for five years and looked at the number of crashes that occur in Kentucky and when most of those happen. And, and uh, the numbers hold up from 15 to 03 as being the highest crash time. And that's why we want you to focus your enforcement during that time. Uh, I know we bounced that back around to two or three different times over the years, but remember that that fits in with what we're talking about on the impaired driving crashes also. Once again, I'm going to say increased not time of the weekend enforcement. Get your guys out there, whatever uh, form your enforcement takes, and make sure that they're seen and visible during that time. Some of the things we talk about doing, of course, not time checkpoints. If you do checkpoints, do them at night time on the weekends. That's the best time to have the biggest impact on, on the numbers. Uh, if you don't do checkpoints, do saturation patrol. Okay, and uh, if you're a small agency, as many of them are in Eastern Kentucky, partner with the county sheriff, partner with the state police, partner with somebody else, and make it a multi-agency saturation patrol. I know you may have only be able to put one person out. So, you know, if the, if the sheriff can put one out, the state police can put one out, then you've got three people working and you're, you're, you've got a pretty effective saturation patrol. Okay, I think that picture was taken at a checkpoint we did uh, in uh, Batesville. All right, let's look at, uh, of course, the latest numbers we have are 2015. Uh, if we, once again, compare and contrast 2014 to uh, 2015, uh, as you can see, the number of prepared crashes is up. Not quite 200, but it is up. Uh, if you look at the number of fatalities, it is down. And once again, what we're, what we're going to see is, as belt usage increases, and severe injuries and fatalities are going to decrease. Okay? And if you, as you look through, you see the number of injuries are up just slightly. But that will give you some idea where we're at. Uh, about 150 people were killed last year just in Kentucky in a fair driving. And like HB said, the number as of today is 81 so far this year have been killed in a fair driving crash. Uh, we always show you this map. Check it out. We can collect a lot of data. I'm trying to give it back out to you. You guys do all these crash reports and send in all this other stuff. We want to make sure that you get some feedback on it. This shows you the top 40 counties. Pretty blessed in the uh, northeast. Not to have that many, but you can see Pike, Floyd are in the top 40. And of course what that uh, tells you is that if you're in one of those counties, then you're an excellent candidate for uh, some type of overtime funding uh, to, to do this program. Now, if we drill that down a little bit, this map talks about just the impaired driving counties. Okay? It's the top 40 overall for impaired driving. All right? And as you can see, the same two counties appear in that. You don't, you don't have anything to get over to Hazard Perry County and then all the way up to Northeast Kentucky. All right, this is a pretty cool map. It's a map of the 2014-2015 impaired driving crashes just in the, the area that Matt and I work, just in the east. And if you look at it, you can see every city. You can see 23, you can see 64. You can see all those roads outlined in, with the blue and the red dots. Pick out your county or your city there and uh, see the dots in the end. 
Okay, breaking down 2015 numbers, uh, this came off of the Toward Zero Desk website. It's where, where these numbers came from. And as you can see, it shows 150 prepared drug and alcohol deaths. Uh, and as we've been talking about for several years, uh, distracted driving has eclipsed impaired driving for the number of deaths. Uh, 182. Uh, aggressives coming on strong also. It's at 133, so you know that's a, another very emerging enforcement issue that's uh, uh, sort of like texting and driving stuff. It's real hard to come up with a way to actually enforce it. But the biggest one, as always, is uh, seatbelt not use, 358. So really basically half the people that were killed in Kentucky last year, maybe just a little more, were not wearing their seatbelt when they were killed in the crash. And you know, you have to feel like that had all those people had their belt on, that it, it, would, it could have saved many of them. Of course, we know there's some crashes that are not survivable. Everybody knows that. But when you look at the percentages and you look at severe injuries compared to minor injuries, you know, uh, it's proven that seat belts will reduce the injuries and reduce many of the fatalities. We have our media partners here with us today, and of course the reason we do that is because we do what's called a high visibility enforcement campaign, which means we tell everybody what we're going to do, then we go out and do it, okay? And the reason we do it that way is because, of course, we're not trying to sneak up on anyone when we do this. We want everybody to know, everybody to <clears throat> designate a driver, uh, stay where they're at, whatever they need to do, not be driving impaired, want everybody to wear their seatbelt, want everybody to know that, that, that we're going to be out of force today. Uh, so, what you, what you do is when you tell everybody, use the media, to, and we, we'll be running state commercials, uh, both uh, radio and TV commercials, those will all be on. Uh, you'll see them on uh, a lot of those satellite channels. Uh, and generally what they try to do is focus in on the 18 to 35, so they'll be on Spike, and they'll be on ESPN, and they'll be on channels like that, the 18 to 35 males, which is the most uh, likely person to be killed in Kentucky in a crash, would be watching. So. Once again, we want to encourage you guys to, to use uh, uh, the information available to you on our webpage or from HB or Sarah. Uh, they're a great resource for you here locally to use them to make sure that you get the word out of uh, what you're doing in your local com community because all you guys uh, represent different communities. You have different media outlets, radio stations. Uh, 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 I've seen them, several of them use uh, those uh, digital signs to announce it, uh, the wheel on uh, cable TV, you know, that goes through all the ads and all that. If you talk to them, they'll, they'll probably give you a space on that, try to get people out. But, you know, go look at that media kit. It only takes a minute. There's the uh, address where it's at. And like I said, I'm sure HB or anybody else would be glad to help you out with uh, what you're trying to do. Uh, of course, one of those media events is today, and we have no plan for Friday the 19th in Northeast Kentucky uh, in Iron Ohio, which is right across the river from National. Uh, we'll be doing that a uh, week from tomorrow. But uh, just so you know, talk for a second about the uh, Drive Sober app. It's a free app that anybody can download. Uh, it's pretty handy. It has uh, uh, alcohol, blood alcohol content estimator. I'm not going <laughs> to. I don't know how accurate that is, you know, but once again, it's uh, I'm sure something people want to look at and stuff, uh, but it has a lot of other strategies and references and stuff, the things to do, planning, or uh, if you get someplace you need a ride, it has cab companies and so forth and so on, things like that that you can use. And like I said, it's a free app for Android or iPhone, either one. Uh, something for you to take back and promote in your community as uh, uh, as we ramp up to drive <coughs> We'll talk for a second about motorcycle crashes. Uh, you can see the number over 1,700 motorcycle crashes. Uh, of those 1,700, 106 were alcohol involved. And of those 106, 15 of them were fatalities, just for motorcycles. Uh, the one number I can tell you that sticks out of the 87 motorcycle fatalities, 67% of those folks were not wearing a helmet. I know we don't have a helmet ball, but once again, it's like the seatbelt thing, you know. There's Obviously, a, a direct correlation between not wearing a helmet and 
being killed in a motorcycle crash. Two thirds of the people are. Matt, what were you telling me about the, the fatalities this weekend? Four motorcycles. Four motorcycle fatalities this weekend in Kentucky. I don't have the number right in front of me, but I think there's about four motorcycle and three commercial vehicles this weekend. I think it's up close to 60 now. I don't know about close to 50, I think. 58? 50. Right at 50. 50 fatalities so far uh, this year in Kentucky for motorcycles. We, we mentioned child passenger safety seats. Of course, there's that gap between the child passenger safety seat and the booster seat. You know, for kids that are too big to actually be in the CPS seat, but are not big enough for a seat belt, because we all know seat belts are made for an adult sized body, not a seven, eight, nine year old sized body. That's what a booster seat does. Basically, a booster seat is a belt positioning booster. It lets them set up high enough the belt, strikes them where it should strike them across the big bones, the hip bones, the shoulder bones, to provide them the kind of protection they need. Please go back, talk to your guys about this. This is something really that we need. Uh, I don't think we had that many uh, of that age fatalities last year. Do you, do you have any idea, man, how many that was last year? Three or something like that? Yes. But one's too many. Again, we're talking about second, third, fourth grade kids, okay? You know, we really need to educate, and if we can't, Get there for education, we need to really step in there and do some strict enforcement to try to get these people using belt position boosters. I uh, wanted to talk to you and remind you that on December 13th at the Hyatt Regency in Lexington, uh, we'll be having the uh, DUI awards. Okay, do this every year. Uh, there'll be a mailing, probably both email and a paper letter, come from our office. Uh, probably in October, so I'll be looking for that, asking you to nominate whoever in your agency has distinguished themselves uh, dealing with impaired drivers. Okay? Uh, once again, like I said, December 13th, I want everybody to be there about 10, get signed in, and the program will start at 11. Generally what they do is they have a little opening, they have a speaker, lunch, and a presentation of the awards. Of course, it's been you know very well attended in the past, and I know almost everybody in this room has participated in the past in it. Appreciate that. Be looking for that. Uh, if you don't get something by November, you probably need to let me or Matt one know because, of course, we want you to we encourage you to participate in it. It doesn't cost you anything. And you get it recognized, one of your guys has uh, done, done some good work. Uh, for those of you that have grant funding with our office, in 2000, September 2017, September 20th, or 16th through the 20th, we're going to have the Governor's Highway Safety Association Conference. It's a national conference in Louisville, Kentucky. It's going to be held at the downtown Marriott in Louisville. Those of you that have a grant and have funding will receive money in that grant to attend this. Uh, I go to the really lucky to have it in Louisville. Uh, it's a great conference. They have uh, speakers from all over, all over the nation. And, uh, uh, you can really, they have a lot of stuff. They talk about drowsy driving. They have people from other states talk about uh, DUI impaired, impaired driving, things like that. So it's a really good chance to get to sort of break out and get, uh, here's some other ideas that people are doing from around the country that are working for them. I'm passing around a sign-up sheet. Please make sure that you get signed up on that before we break for lunch. All right, I have another video here. This video is uh, from uh, Dr. Beth Baker uh, uh, from Region 3, NHTSA. Uh, short video, just a kind of a message she wanted to, uh, to give to law enforcement because, uh, once again, you know, uh, much of the success of our program depends on law enforcement and how you guys do. So we'll, we'll uh, watch this. Hi everyone, this is Beth Baker, I'm the Regional Administrator for NHTSA's Region 3 office, and I'm here to talk to you about this, camp this year's campaign, Drive Sober or Get Pulled Over 2016. Yeah, we've made tremendous gains in impaired driving over the years, but there's still a lot of work to be done. The numbers have about been halved since 1982 when we started keeping really good track of these things. 
But the interesting thing about these numbers is that even though they keep going down, still every year alcohol-related fatalities account for about 30% of our traffic fatalities. And that's far too many. We have a long way to go to solve this problem. And this is why we do this campaign every year. We like to get publicity out on a national level, on a state level, and on a local level to let people out there know that if they're going to drive impaired, the fine law enforcement of Kentucky is going to be out there as well. And if you drive impaired, you will be caught. You know, this is a, a problem that no law enforcement officer wants to face when they come upon an impaired driving crash and they have to make the notification to the family that someone has been killed in a drunk, drunk driving crash. It's a really senseless, preventable crime. But make no mistake, it is a crime and that's what you are out there trying to prevent. So I would encourage you to go out and make sure that you participate in a checkpoint, that you sign up to participate in extra saturation patrol. Most of the time there is overtime money available. I'm not making a promise on that, but most of the time there is, and we encourage you to take advantage of that. Join a checkpoint with some of your fellow officers out there. I know it's hard work, and it's usually done late at night on weekends when you'd rather be home with your family. But we really appreciate the work that you do, and it's vital to bringing down those impaired driving fatalities. So when you're thinking about signing up for, for extra duty, know, again, that you may very well be saving a life out there. So sign up for an extra tour of duty. Work with your law enforcement liaisons if you need training, if you need an SFST refresher course, or you're interested in other training. It's, it's a tough job. Detecting and dealing with drunk drivers is not an easy job. And so if you get out there and you get the training to do that, it will make it a little bit easier, and we would certainly appreciate that you do that. So thank you again for what you do, and go out and get one more DUI. Remember I told you I was going to mention this three or four times? Once again, the online reporting deadline is September 19th. Please put that in your calendar and make sure to remember to go to your online account and drop your numbers in before September 19th. This is my contact information and of course uh, there's a couple of good resources on there, especially for you guys in the media. Uh, that CDC website and the NHTSA website both have uh, information both on uh, enforcement and on uh, you know, both alcohol uh, and uh, drugs and driving. I looked at the numbers from the clicker ticket uh, campaign, the two clicker ticket campaign, and about two thirds of the uh, of the DUI arrests were for alcohol. It was like set, it was like I think 1,100, and it was like seven and change for alcohol, and the rest of them were uh, drugs, which surprised me. I thought it would be even up, or maybe even more on the drug side. Now that's what the numbers we received show. Uh, by the way, it was coming in. Does anybody have any questions on this? When we've talked about the dates, the reporting. Uh, I know the ones of you that have grant funding, I think the many grant folks should have got the contracts yesterday via email. Anybody have any questions about any of that? Now's a good time. Uh, we have a couple things we want to do, of course, obviously the sign-up sheets uh, going around. Please don't move to you sign, to you sign the sign-up sheet. Uh, Matt, do you have anything? I'm good. Uh, for those of you, I think everybody knows Matt. Uh, Matt's the program director for the eastern part of the state. Uh, of course, I, I do the liaison part, and he does the program part. Uh, what we're going to do, one thing I wanted to mention to you back in the back of the room, I have some program enhancement materials back there. Uh, there's some plastic bags there too if you need to gather up some of that stuff. I think there's some keychains, some pens, some notepads, stuff like that, what we have left to give away. So uh, I would encourage you before you leave to get some of that stuff and use it to try to help get the word out on uh, what we're trying to do here as far as drive sober and everything goes. Uh, 
And once again, I want to thank everybody for coming, and uh, especially our, our, our folks, I guess, across the river, basically. Uh, appreciate that. Once again, thank you, everybody. For